traditional doctors. Okay, and that's the end, and I will take any questions. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Generation. What is that? I'm not sure what that means. Spontaneous, uh, 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 I don't, I'm not really a scientist, but uh, the latest thing I read um, said that life was, life was possibly generated in the deep sea by the interaction of uh, volcanic, yeah, so I kind of believe that, but, but what's your point? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh huh. Go ahead. I was in Uganda about four years ago, and a lot of the stuff you're showing, I've seen that. It's, it's a hard thing to come back and you know have walk away from that and realize how different these people are. Uh huh. Um, one of the problems I know is. And this this lady was serving me coffee in a restaurant, and I was marking papers from the, the people that I've been teaching. Uh -huh. um, and uh, she she asked, you know, where are you a teacher? Well, so am I. That's how the story came up. And so we started talking, and I found out how, uh, as a part of the conversations, went on for over a number of days as I kept going back to the coffee shop, how little she ate. Okay, so yeah. She was making, I think it was uh, her, her monthly wage as a teacher was like $28 a month. Uh -huh. and she couldn't afford to her family. Or anything like that. She's having a hard time. So now she moved to the coffee shop and she's very happy. Yeah. But so, in terms of that, what you guys are doing, uh -huh. and the way that you're carrying that you got teachers working in schools, what's your plan to sort of uh, lift them up in that sense? Um, yeah, in regards to what you uh, mentioned, that is one thing that we're doing, which is. Um, we're raising money for teacher salaries. Uh, the last number I heard was the teachers get paid forty-four dollars a month, uh, which averages out to you know around the five hundred dollars a year that they, that they seem to make. But because the teacher salary is low, um, a lot of teachers quit, and these kids are suddenly they don't have a teacher, or or perhaps the teacher uh, doesn't show up for a couple of days because they got another job that's going to pay them. Um, you know, two dollars a day instead of whatever. So, um, so we try to help that. What we're really trying to do now is um, we're trying, we're trying, we're really, we're asking, we're asking all of our humanist schools for uh, project proposals. Okay, uh, and I, and and they're they're being really good. They're sending us project proposals uh, for businesses that they want to start. I'm, I'm now getting like one or two a day. I got one today, somebody wants to start, uh, they want to make uh, briquettes. Uh, yesterday, somebody wants to start a coffee shop, a uh, day before, somebody wants to start a pineapple farm. You know, So we're trying to give them seed money uh, to, uh, to, to start businesses. The other thing that we're doing is we're offering microloans to individuals. We're only offering microloans to individuals who are teachers. Because like you said, they all need a second job. So we, we have been giving out microloans to teachers who want to start like uh, food stores, um, piggeries, um, just farms. So yeah, we're trying to we're trying to especially the teachers because we, we, we don't they're, you know these teachers are really good but they're not getting paid that much so we want to help all the humanist teachers. I, I hope I answered your question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I'll keep here. Go ahead. Uh, besides the, the business with the orphans and, and um, being kidnapped for mm -hmm. sacrifices, mm -hmm. um, uh, what kind of threat does the mainstream religions here, Anglicans and, and Catholics, pose to the humanist schools? I, I mean, uh, you said they don't like them. Um, yeah, yeah, is yeah. Is there any threat from them? Uh, yeah. And not that Wambali would be able to answer that. He sometimes he sounds really persecuted in his Facebook posts. I get like it really bothers him that his um, that they're saying mean things about him. And sometimes we worry about him. Uh, about six months ago, his his sister was murdered, and so um, his sister was murdered. When I say his sister, it could be he has uh, his dad had multiple wives, so it might be like a half sister. But his sister was indeed murdered. She was murdered. Uh, supposedly it was because she was behind her payments on a Toyota. Um, 
Uh, so we, you know, bad things do happen to people. Um, uh, they haven't happened to Bombali, and he's he's pretty darn fearless. He's kind of a he's kind of a he's kind of a big man. I mean, not like physically, but when I'm hanging out with him, uh, people are kind of in awe of him. Like uh, like I'll hang out with him in just the principal's office, and people will just kind of come in and they'll sit down, and they'll just want to kind of be around him. <laughs> And they'll say something to him, and he might answer, he might not. It's a, it's a whole kind of African thing I don't get. I, I don't know if I'm answering your question. He, I, I, we worry about him. He doesn't particularly seem afraid. There, there is no, there has been no, you know, direct attacks of, or any violence against any of our humanist schools yet. Some of it, I think. Some of it, I think, is. Uh, that they don't understand in a way. They don't quite understand. They, they don't, he doesn't, Bambali doesn't like me to use the word atheist too much. I think, right. I think that is a more problematic word. So he'll say, just please use the word humanist when you talk about my school. So I think that is a little, um, diffuses a, something. Right. And sometimes they go, and sometimes, <laughs> I remember I was in Tarumba, and I was, I was saying, um, we want to start some humanist schools here. We want you to, uh, and and then, and, and there's kind of like a chief in Charumba that I always email with, and he goes, he goes, you want to start humanist schools? He goes, what's a humanist school? And then I explained it. And he goes, he goes, okay, as long as it's not Muslim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that was his point of view. So he was, he was fine with it. He was fine. Like I said, they're they're pragmatic. So if uh, I. I he didn't, there's no real problem with it. And there's actually, when you look at the, the, the single most problematic thing that we, that we do as humanists is that we, I think, is that we, there's a couple things, but we promote women's equality. Right. I've had uh, four problems with the humanist schools. Uh, like there was this one, the last one, the Yakayumbo, where first I got an email from a man there, and he said, we're not going to join, we're going to stay Christian. And then I got an email from the, the women, the widows, and they're like, we want to join. And then I go, you guys work it out. And then I got an email that said, the women outvoted the men. And I think it's all about gender equity. So, and I've had the Anglicans kind of step up and stop us from like, uh, we were kicked out of two schools recently. Like, two women contacted me from, one was from Mujito Girls Vocational School, and she said, we want to be humanists, and then there's another one called the Kiribati, uh, Kiribati School. And both times, women contacted me and said we want to become humanists. And then, like three days later, they said, "I'm sorry, we can't become humanists." The Anglican minister on our board said we can't, or something. So the Anglican ministers, I I, I think it's personally about gender and about uh, a lot of these men being afraid of giving women uh, equal rights. I don't think they see it as equal rights. I think they see it as domineered by women, and, and they don't want it. So I think that's, and the other thing that I think that the Anglican ministers don't like is they don't like us um, giving out free condoms to high schoolers. They don't like us, uh, abortion is a huge deal. They don't like us saying abortion is okay, divorce is okay. Yeah, I mean, when we, when yeah. we hear Anglican here, I mean, it's you know, yeah. fairly benign. Western Anglican, Canadian Anglican. Yeah. Well, when you hear Anglican over in Africa, you're hearing all these. The, yeah. Where the split between. Yeah. You know, the, the African Anglican yeah. bishops and, and, and the rest of the church. Yeah. Along, I, uh, I would. I was talking last night a little bit. One thing that we don't do. I mean, we we do it in the we in our in our in my lectures that I email to them. I say, uh, we believe everybody has the right to to marry. Uh, any any man or woman that they want, even if you know. So we support gay rights, but that's not like the first thing we say, right? Because the resistance on that would be huge. Because I tried it out a little bit, and then I was I was told that the average Ugandan thinks that uh, a gay person is a pedophile, is a pedophile. So I can't go in there as a humanist and say I support pedophilia because I won't get anywhere. So I we don't. That's not at the forefront of what we do, and I and I think gay rights is hugely important. But my personal thing, I probably think, condom use is the most important. That's because that's actually going to save 
a lot of lives. Okay. Is there uh, there's some other question right here? Go ahead. Okay, the thing with this, unfortunately, sacrificing all the orphans. I always, because I saw other TV programs, and they were talking mostly about albino kids. Yes, albino kids are also killed. Oh, it's not kids. All albinos are in danger. That is more in Tanzania and some other places. Leo Igwe writes about it. Tan uh, albinos are in trouble, which always kind of freaks me out because I'm a white person. Um, and hunchbacks and people that are like lame uh, are also any kind of deformity. I, I don't. I don't know what it. Is. All I can think about is these witch doctors. I haven't even talked about the, the AIDS thing. There's like cures for AIDS that they believe they're absolutely horrible. There's the whole sex with a virgin, you know, which basically means uh, raping young girls. There's also a belief in um, that having sex with a pygmy uh, will cure AIDS. And there's, there's, there are pygmies in Uganda, and they're, they're regularly raped. And there's, uh, anyway, so these are all, and sometimes I just think these witch doctors just make up the craziest thing they can think of. Because they just think, go ahead. Well, yeah. the business about, you saying all the deformities on yeah. whatever, that's in the Bible. Oh, it is? Yeah, like this business about you can't go to the altar if you have any kind of deformity. I can't help you out with the I can't recover. I don't exactly remember, but it's in the Old Testament, absolutely. Yeah. Anybody that's lame or, mm -hmm. or has crushed genitalia or something, that's in the Old Testament. Uh -huh. All these deformities are listed. Uh, so I don't know if it comes from their tradition mm -hmm. or something comes from some missionaries. Yeah. They've got the Bible in the top of that. I don't know. Yeah. But it's in the Bible or maybe some book. We had a debate on our website once. I, I got a uh, an African. He was a Nigerian, and he's like an anti-colonialist. So he wrote this essay called Christianity and Islam Out of Africa, and he got a, everybody read it. Everybody loved the idea. He was like, Christianity and Islam are bad. Get it out of Africa, and then he, but he also wrote in it, bring back uh, traditional African religion. <laughs> Leo, Leo Igwe went crazy on him because Leo Igwe was just like, Christianity's terrible. Islam's worse than Christianity. It's terrible. The worst is traditional African religion. Don't think that going back in time is a good idea. So Leo Igwe is a phenomenal great guy. Yeah. I G W E. Yeah, great guy. Heard him speak at a, uh -huh. at a conference. He uh -huh. is amazing. He's a great guy. And horror stories. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's a brave guy. Quest, go ahead. Uh, what's a typical school day for these kids? Uh, like, what's their curriculum? Uh, you know, is it uh -huh. recess? I don't actually know. Uh, uh, see reading, writing, you know, math, uh, basic math school. Uh, there's a lot of science at Bombali School. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry I don't know that I'm I'm even a sponsor for a kid. Go ahead. Robert was talking about, he had um, some pictures up about some land that he had uh, at the school. And they were teaching the kids farming. And uh, it was interesting because he said that they, they were letting the teachers do mm -hmm. some of the farming. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but they, so the they, they kids go outside a lot. It doesn't happen in a lot of schools where everybody said there's a lot of science and a lot of Things, you know, he was he was wishing that there was a there's a project going on in Uganda right now, uh, teaching critical thinking to Ugandan children in terms of medical stuff. And Robert was like, I really want this at my, at my school, but his school wasn't chosen to be one of these test schools. So, um, he's watching it very carefully. Yeah, and it, it's fascinating stuff. Some of his curriculum is on on the. Uh, on his school's website, you can yeah. go through. I don't know exactly the different terms uh -huh. in that, but you can go through a lot of what he teaches in that. And yeah. One of the things that impressed me was um, was uh, the IEHU uh, Human Rights and the um, UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights and uh -huh. Rights of the Child and that kind of stuff. And they teach all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And and it's um, yeah. And the bravo for him. I do have a board member who's very interested in your question. That's something I'm weak on. She's always like, oh, you know, are we actually providing a good education? Uh, I, the one thing I do know is that uh, my brother provides uh, scholarships for kids to go um, on to high school. But, they, but he, gives, he gives scholarships to the four best grades 
from the Akayumbo Widow's Orphanage in science. So he gets, Bombale gives the kids a science test and then he sends the science test, uh, the answers to my brother, my brother picks out. And anyway, my brother says that the science tests are really hard. So um, I, I, I should put up a slide of it. They're pretty darn interesting. Yeah. They're all, they're all very African. It's like uh, pictures of snakes and asking like which one's poisonous. So stuff like that, it's practical knowledge. Go ahead. I was wondering, I've been aware for a while of the problem with um, menstruation for young girls. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Huge problem. Uganda, right? I mean, it's All of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, anywhere where it's a low income, yeah. it's a huge so problem. Yeah. So I wonder, um, you know, you said I don't remember which school, but you said that one of them you had set up sewing so they could make their own. I mean, is that yeah. a solution to that problem that like, could help? I mean, it's the broader. I you know, think that it's. I think that that. Or are they just making it like for their community? I'm trying to get them to make it as a, um, it's, a it's an organization called uh, Girls Education Movement, GEM. So we call them GEM pads. And uh, we got a, you know, we got them two sewing machines and they, they can make these GEM pads and they're going to sell them at the AfroPad price. Um, I, I think that there, there's probably some smart moms out there who have figured out how to make these. Apparently, homemade menstrual pads have been made for hundreds of years. You know, yeah, hundreds, yeah, thousands of years. So you, you don't, have, so you don't have to be. So a girl who doesn't go to school because she doesn't have one is like her mom's not taking care of her or something, or because it's and, and they they make these they make these uh, uh, washable menstrual pads in the United States too. I found they sell them at like. Uh, herb stores. We yeah. actually yeah. have a yeah. store. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's a good question. Uh, you, you don't buy one. You buy a pack that I think is four. You get four in a pack because you got to wear one and then wash it and then you know more about this than I do. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so it comes like with a whole case and everything. Okay. Yeah, but uh, a hugely important item. Go ahead. Uh, my question is this, is that uh, looks to me like you guys are just really good at work. Uh, one of the, the issues that I ran into when I was in Wolfie was that we ended in Canada and was lack of running water. Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, I had a, a long period <coughs> with a director of a company uh -huh. that couldn't see why he wanted to have a, his plant operators each of them had running water either in their, in their home or in their direct necessity. Uh -huh. For disease vector control. Yeah. So that the, 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 his business continuity is based on the fact that the people have running water. Yeah. So have you given much thought to that for these schools? I know it's pretty tough for you because schools have them where they have them. Yeah. And people don't have water control, but is that a part of your plan? Um, we're lucky. We have a guy on the board who is, um, he's, he's in this group called Engineers Without Borders. Right. And he's, a, he's, he's our water guy. He's our water guy and our solar electricity guy. And I refer those kind of questions to him. And he's also a guy who loves Uganda and goes over there like three times a year. So they know him and they see him a lot more than me. So uh, I, the only thing that we've done with water is that one pipeline that we built. And you know, I find those problems like just, just kind of overwhelming. You know, that there's a, a village of 200 people and they have to walk six miles a day to get water? I mean, the first hot thought that goes to my head is, have you thought of moving the village, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so uh, I'm, not, I'm not really the guy to ask. I mean, sometimes... The some, population density is so high, yes. moving the village is only going to put it somebody else's village by the river. It's quite possible. That, that yeah. well, the only thing that I'm doing along those lines is I've, got, I've gotten it in my head that I want to learn some technical skills. So I'm learning how to make a water purification tank, which you can do, you get these three big uh, like empty water jugs and you fill them with, I think it goes sand, gravel, charcoal. And for some reason that I don't understand, you can put like filthy water in the top and by the time it goes through the sand, gravel, and charcoal, it's purified. So that's what the internet says. <laughs> so, 
Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, but there are like uh, nonprofits that are making these for you already, but that's not going to be good. My goal is the next time I next time I go to Uganda, I, I'm going to have three skills. One is to know, is to to show them that thing, you know, because that's you know if you can do that, you can go to the filthy pond and get the bad water and pour it in that thing, and then you can have clean water. Well, Robert, so, has, um, when I was. Uh, looking around, you can buy water tanks. Yeah, and you can set. And I don't know. I don't know. They use that for potable water, or do they use that for irrigation yes. water? Yes. What there is, there is these things called rainwater catchment tanks. And what you do is you just you cover the roof with this slanted aluminum thing. So it, when it rains, and in Uganda, it rains, and then the rain goes into the into the tank, and then you have fresh water. So, yeah. So that's that's one way to get water. Um, that, that's pricey. That's about a thousand dollars. Yes. You just mentioned the internet, and on that line of thought, is there going to be much effort to develop computer technology as a way yes. of uh, yes. then developing uh, yes. the exposed to the uh, yes. developed world? Yes. Come to Uganda with us. That, it's interesting because I ask, I'm trying to take, uh, I live in this little town called Piedmont, I'm trying to get the local high school to send volunteers. So I asked Bombali, I said, what do you want the uh, volunteers to teach? And he goes, computer skills. And I was kind of like, oh jeez. You know, so like, do these kids really want to go to Africa and teach computer skills? You know, it doesn't sound right. But the reality is, why has Bombali succeeded? Because he has mastered the internet, you know what I mean? And, I'm and what I'm trying to do now with all of the schools, we have 11 schools, is I'm trying to teach them how to use the internet so they can do their own fundraising. Bombali can raise his own funds now, and he does from around the world because he knows how to do all that social media stuff. So yeah, that's our goal, is to, is to take high schoolers there and teach them how to make videos and put them on YouTube, to teach them uh, you know, how to set up a Facebook page, how to post on it. Because I, I, I don't think that my organization, it's, it's too much work to, to, to give 11 humanist schools all the money that they want. You know, it's too much work. So I'm trying to make them self-sustainable. Uh, and one of the ways to do that is to teach them internet skills. It's super difficult. I have, you know, like one of these, things happen all the time. Like uh, last week, someone emailed me. Someone disappeared for like three weeks. I sent her money and she was gone. And I'm like, I don't, I don't really like that. And finally she e emailed me back and said, no, she, a friend of hers emailed me and said, uh, 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 Lois is sorry she hasn't contacted you. She forgot her, her email and password. Do you have it? I'm just like, I don't have her email password. You know? It's like just ridiculous. So I'm constantly running into like, because that's, these people, it's it's really hard to fundraise for people if they don't if they if they don't email you back on time, and if they don't set up a bank account, and if they don't send you their you know if they don't send you their phone number. Uh, with Bombali with and the people that have it together, it's amazingly easy. I can get money through PayPal, and I can I can send that money to the Ugandans' phone through this organization called World Remit. I can send the money to their phone like in five minutes. So it can work incredibly fast. Faster than I could get money to an American. Well, I can send it to them PayPal, but, but really, really quickly. But without the Ugandans knowing how to use the internet, uh, it's really difficult working with them. Um, yes? I did have one more. Huh? One question. Um, with, with Robert, well, all, the, all this building going on, yeah. What is the? Have you noticed the spin-off benefit in the surrounding community of? Oh yeah. People getting to work. Uh, I just yeah, I noticed yeah, yeah, two yeah. shots that yeah. hey, yeah. that guy looks like the same guy that was building that building in this picture two months ago. And, yeah. And it just I thought, well, is this is there a lot of full-time employment now? Yeah. Yeah. Bombali, Bombali, like. Uh, we built the Zoha, and then Cajandera is only a mile away. And um, he said, when we, when we started building Cajandera, he goes, the community loves me. You know, we're hiring people. And sometimes you, you don't even hire, because they actually hire construction crews 
to, to build the building. But then other people get hired, you have to hire people. A large part of the budget is getting people to carry water to the construction crew. So they have water to drink. And so they have water to mix like the clay with. So everybody, yeah, everybody likes that income. Yeah. I wanted to tell you uh, the three things that I'm trying to make. Uh, one is the water filtration thing, and the other thing is solar ovens, which would be fantastic. And the third one is making briquettes, because uh, th there's a huge problem with fuel in Uganda, which is basically uh, when they want fuel, they're going out and chopping down their forest. Like uh, I read that Kenya has chopped down 95% of its forest, and Uganda is headed in that direction too. So we're trying to get them to make um, briquettes fuel out of uh, newspapers and compost and trash so that um, you know they're not cutting down the trees anymore. Okay. Uh, I don't know about even uh, eating water, like those little soap black drums, solar, sorry. No problem. Like they need, I assume they need hot water, boiling water. Yeah. Yeah. Because some, I mean some of these tropical places have those, uh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'd really like to learn more about solar, you know, solar energy. Uh, any other questions? Go ahead. My topic is a few topics back. Go ahead. Hand up. <laughs> but it goes back to the, the periods of the girls going to school. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's all fine and great that you give them pads and they can go to school, fantastic, but is there a stigma against them going to the school in a place where superstition is so, is it, are they cursing it if they go, or the, are they unclean if they attend during a period? Are they ruining Not that crops, I know of. But, you know? <laughs> Not that I know of. The, the, biggest yeah. problem, the biggest problem is going to school uh, with a pad that doesn't work and having an accident mm -hmm. and being humiliated not only by your by your male classmates, but being humiliated by the teacher. Because the, there is a stigma against it. I mean, they don't want to see that somebody's having an accident with a period. That's like, that's, like that's that an period. awful thing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's like an awful thing. And, and the girls want to avoid that happening, so they might not go to school like that. But there's no sense of them being unclean or cursing the school if they show up. Like yeah. in some cultures, you can hear that. Where it's, yeah. You know, I, I, I don't like know. Later, you had a, you know. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually kind of a taboo topic there. Like even Bombali, I think we had to ask him three times, do you want Afropaths? No comment. Do you want Afropaths? No, you know, finally we got him. Yes. The other thing, which is kind of interesting, uh, the girls are in need of what's called girls' changing rooms. And that is, and that's just a, a room, a private girl for room, a private room for girls to go in and change their pads. And I think it's because uh, the latrines are sort of public or something like that. I don't know. But they need private they need private changing rooms. And so we've only built one of those so far. We, it, it only costs three hundred dollars. We built one, and then but it's that's supposed to be a big deal because that's the other fear is that you're at school and you have to change your pad, or you're going to have an accident and you have nowhere to change your pad. And it isn't just a problem for the school girls. It's a school. It's a problem for the teachers. The teachers worry about that too, so we're. That's another thing. We're, but we've only built one of those so far. So what yeah. are the latrines like? Then there's no structure. Like is it, there's, there's a wall. wall. Yeah, so there's a wall. You know. I don't. The pictures don't, that we've seen, I've seen have been. Uh, is um, I don't know whether Robert or one of the other ones talked about the fact that they had proper latrines was a huge deal for the girls, especially the girls going to school, because the boys could beat at them when they were using it. So the, you know what, there was, there were, I saw a picture of uh, something, something that were building with doors, uh -huh. and, and it closed in, but yeah. whether those doors lead into this, like, like a, a private one bowler, or whether it's a two bowler, or whatever, for separating by gender, I wasn't sure. But yeah, I know that some of the, the, some of the latrines have doors, and some of them don't, but, but sometimes I ask, like I'll go, next time we stay there, can we stay uh, at such and such place? And they'll say, they'll say, you don't want to stay there, the latrines aren't private. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I, I think there's some latrines that are not so private. Any other questions? Okay, yeah. 
what do you use, or what do they use, uh -huh. for teaching materials in the schools, the like textbooks, paper, uh, chalkboards, like all the oh, yeah. supplies? Yeah, uh, they have they have chalkboards. They have um, that's one of the things we buy a lot is um, furniture. Uh, Bombali has his own uh, wood shop. Uh, it's the only school that has that where he makes his own furniture. Um, and they have a Uganda textbooks. Uh, we had a slight problem with this, which is we do this scholastic thing, which is we send uh, we we have sent thousands of books over there, but. I'm, but unfortunately, all the books I think we send there are of white kids doing unexplainable things. <laughs> you know? And so I'm kind of, I, I don't do this scholastic thing anymore. I had someone on the board who was really good at it, and she, I, she, we probably spent, sent $10,000 of books over there. And, and she got kind of angry because she felt like she wasn't appreciated enough, not by me, but by the actual Ugandans who weren't thanking her enough for the books. But, but I think we were just sending them books. No kids in it looked like Ugandans, and they weren't doing anything that made any sense. <laughs> like, 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 what is that? What is that? Uh, Thomas the Train or something? <laughs> they, they've never seen a train. They have no idea what's going on. Um, so they have Ugandan textbooks. And finally, I did talk to Bombali about this, and he said it would be better if you just sent me money and I bought Ugandan. School books. So, what are the books like then? Are like, for instance, are they based on proper science and mm -hmm. critical thinking? You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. I've never, I've like, never seen them. Do they actually have a you know, educational curriculum that they have to follow? Or? There, there is. There's a, there is actually a uh, Ugandan curriculum, and Bombali is, uh, it's competitive. Like when we drive around, like Kasisi, he'll go. That's cool. That's a good school. They're two notches ahead of me. Uh, two two points ahead of me. So he know the schools are ranked like in terms of like, just like they are in the United States and probably Canada or something. There's a certain ranking, and so they're they're all being um, uh, yeah ranked by the government in some kind of. Are all the other test. schools religious? The like overwhelming it? amount of schools there are where well, there's public schools and the people don't want to send their kids to the. The public schools are theoretically free, although I think you still have to pay for the uniform and some other kind of stuff. Um, they say that people who have any money at all don't want to send their kids to the public school. I, I showed one picture of Mugete, which was uh, uh, is, which is the only public school that we fund. I would say that this is what it's like. It's a room about a third as big as this room, and there's 80 kids in it. Right, and they're all sitting on the floor. So what you get if you send your kid to a private school is you only get like 40 kids in a classroom instead of 80. But I think the public school is, um, yeah, people seem to want to avoid that. It's so, it's so. The, the money private that, schools are run by the by the churches as well. No, the private schools are run by um, some. A lot of the private schools are run by churches, Catholics and Anglicans. There's a lot of them. Um, there are some private schools that are run that are non-denominational, and they, um, but uh, they don't charge that much. A private school will charge like twenty-nine dollars a year tuition to send like a preschooler, and then I think the price goes up to like forty-six dollars a year. It's still a lot of money when you're not making. Yeah, if that's for like a sixth grader, and it actually costs like a hundred dollars a year to send a kid to high school, um, but. Um, so it's not it's not a lot, but uh, you know. Uh, any other questions? That's about it. Oh, question. I have one that's just sort of coming back and forth in my mind for a while. Uh -huh. You mentioned how the end of people are, are pragmatic and that they're going to go with what whichever way well, works essentially. Yeah. Uh, but I know just from experience here that some religious people, um, uh, when presented with logic, when presented with all kinds of solid argument, will not sway. Uh -huh. Must wait. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are uh -huh. the Ugandan people so? I don't understand how they would be so quick to switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it is it a real difference like that? Or well, just jump ship? I need I need to retract my statement slightly. Uh, one thing is that we were ma mainly mainly with the Bukonzo, and that's so it's only one tribe. So I can say the Bukonzo are pragmatic, and I think they are actually known to be kind of pragmatic. They're kind of like kind of business oriented. 
Like when, as soon as I say, uh, we're going to fund, you know, business proposals, they're just all, all over it. And I, I imagine, it may be true in a lot of the developed world where people are poor, that they that they'd spend all day trying to figure out how to make money. That's mm -hmm. just what they do. And they, they tell me that's, that's what we talk about, that's what we do, we try to figure out how to make money. So, uh, but there, but there are cases, um, I do, I do, um, like say that Rays of Light Orphanage School, they had a, a schism when they became humanist, and the, the minister of course was kicked off the board, <coughs> but I lost this other guy, I cannot remember his name, uh, Muhindo Zachariah, and he, he was like, I considered him kind of a pal, he was like somebody I knew. He was like a, a big leader in the school. But he just sent me like a long email saying, I believe in Jesus, blah, blah, blah. I'm not leaving the, the church. I'm not going to, I'm out of here. You know, so that's a guy with uh, faith. So he, he, he gave up his position and everything because the school turned into, became humanist. I can see this bad I got, I have one, I have one, it's two of them. I have one kind of funny, uh, I, I have a sort of a problematic relationship because this town of Chirumba where we have like, we have about six humanist schools, there's kind of a chief there. He's kind of like the boss. So I send him a lot of money and email and say, do this, do this, do this, do this. And he tells me he's like a humanist, right? Because I'm a humanist now. Before he told me he was Catholic, he also has three wives. So the Catholics say he's not really Catholic. They accuse him of being a Muslim. But, you know, but he tells me, so he tells me he's a humanist. But then I caught him because we fund one Catholic school there. No, we fund one Anglican school there, and that's because I have an evangelical brother who has, who has begged me to let him help uh, a religious school. So I do it, you know. He gives me $1,500 a year, and we fund this one school. But he was late once. And the chief, Joseph Casabarihi, wrote him an email, and my brother finally paid up. And my brother sent me Joseph's email. And Joseph's email was all about, uh, uh, my brother's name is Renee, it was all about, Dear Renee, I have been thinking about you and praying to God about you and praying to Jesus about you and thinking about you and how we both love God. And it went on and on. And so, Chief Joseph, when he talks to me, he's a humanist. He talks to Catholics, he's a Catholic. When he talks to my brother, he's whatever my brother wants to be. So, That's the practicality. <laughs> and I think that is probably true for a lot of people. You know? So I, I, uh, this just kind of goes on and on. There's a, a guy there who asked me for money a lot, and I, he, and finally I, he kind of asked me if I was mad at him. I said I am mad at you because the last time I went. To your, he, he runs a carpentry workshop for orphans that we used to give money to and we quit. And I said, the last time I went to your carpentry workshop, you invited a priest and he talked and he, and he wanted us to pray and I'm not into that. And so you got to stop it. And he goes, I'll never do it again. I'm a humanist. You know? <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. So, uh, so am I? Yeah. So I, are these people going to be really good humanists. I would say out of these eight new um, humanist schools we have, I, I would think the women run ones are pretty committed to it. And I'm not sure about the male run ones. Yeah. What about the children? The kids? I mean, the children are going to be eminently drawn in with this, so I would think they would have a better chance of absorbing the... the yeah. Well, um, that's a, that's a really good question. Don't they say even in the, like the United States that 70% of kids are what their parents are or something like this? Yeah. So you got to factor that in. I don't know. Well, all children start out being what their parents are. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you got to break yeah. away. Yeah. yeah. But these are orphanages, most of them. Right. Presumably there's, there's no parents or there's no contact with them. Yeah, yeah. I, I've changed a, on my opinion. When I started off, I was a little bit, when I started converting, I was just like, this is awesome. For just Afropads, I can convert all of Africa, you know? <laughs> this is awesome. And, but now I'm at the point where I'm thinking like, and Bwambali Robert was a little, uh, probably maybe a lot annoyed with me, because I think he would prefer if I just, just funded him, and why am I spending all this money, you know, 
converting other people, and he's always sending me notes going, uh, they're not really humanists, don't trust them, blah, 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 but I can't really trust him because he wants the money. So, but, um, uh, but now I'm kind of at the point where it, I, think, I think the best thing that, that my organization can do is to create um, seriously committed humanist uh, communities that, are, that have good schools and are economically prospering. I think that would be good. Because I think if we have humanist communities that are, that are flourishing, where the kids are learning and where uh, people, are, people and their businesses are working, I think that'll be an example that will be appealing, much more than a bunch of dirt poor, dysfunctional humanist schools. That, that's not going to be attractive. So, Any other questions? Yes? I just wanted to say thank you for everything you do. Oh, thank you. Thank you.